I, I think we can get started. Um, good morning. I'm Harrison Hong, professor of economics at Columbia University. Uh, in 2019, Columbia University's Program for Economic Research and Capital Fund Management launched an initiative to explore and analyze how alternative data can be used to further the understanding of financial markets, uh, improve economic forecasting, and enhance investment strategies. Uh, through a series of seminars and workshops, this initiative focuses on understanding how alternative data can be used to better understand price formation by looking at a range of non-traditional data sets uh, that have yet to be fully analyzed. Today, uh, we welcome Professor Alberto Caballo of Harvard Business School uh, to speak on the role of alternative data in measuring inflation. Uh, the topic couldn't be more timely given concerns regarding inflation at the moment uh, in global economies. Uh, just this morning, I woke up to a report uh, on Axios uh, of a poll by Civic Science that says that 42% uh, of Americans reported being very concerned about inflation, uh, and this number jumps to 77% for those who think that COVID-19 uh, will only last uh, uh, a couple of more months. Uh, before we, uh, uh, after Alberto's talk, uh, that's going to be followed by a panel discussion with Professor Mike Woodford of Columbia, uh, Professor Jose Schenkman of Columbia, and Eve uh, Lamperieri of uh, CFM. Uh, and uh, before I introduce Alberto, uh, let me uh, in, uh, introduce uh, Adam Reyes of CFM to say a few words about our initiative uh, before we get started. Adam. Uh, thank you, Harrison. Um, hello, everyone. Um, CFM per alternative data initiative has been launched because of how important alternative data has become in investing and in economics. Um, the joint initiative enables PhD students to use alternative data sets in their research projects and provides a platform for cross collaboration of academics and investment professionals. While many of the alternative data sources are novel and previously unexplored, it is important to maintain the same high standards of academic rigor when assessing their usefulness in explaining stock market and economic phenomena. Currently, um, CFM is hosting two groups of students and their projects are due to be completed by July this year. Also, as a part of the CFM per um, alternative data initiative, we periodically organize seminars, such as this one, um, on data sets and research that seem particularly timely. And today's edition is dedicated to innovative work done by Alberto Cavallo on real-time inflation measurements. Um, without further ado, uh, let's learn something new. Thank you, and over to you, Harrison. Great, thanks, Adam. All right, our speaker today, Alberto Caballo, uh, is the uh, Edgar Lee Family Associate Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. Um, he's a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a member of the Technical Advisory Committee of the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS. Uh, Al Alberto co-founded the Billion Prices Project, an, an academic initiative to pioneer the use of online data to conduct research on high frequency price dynamics and inflation measurement. Uh, he received a PhD from Harvard University in 2010, an MBA from MIT Sloan in 2005, and his uh, bachelor's is from the Universidad de San Andreas in Argentina in 2000. Alberto, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me thank the organizers. I'm really humbled and honored to be presenting at this seminar. When, when I was invited, I was told... Uh, that the intention of the seminar series is to expose PhD students to these alternative data sources and, and, uh, and how they can be used for uh, academic work. So I prepared a presentation where I'm gonna tell you the story of how I got started with this while I was a PhD student, hopefully give you ideas of things you, you can also do and encourage you to collect uh, your own data in some ways. And then towards the end of the presentation, I'll focus more on how this could be used for forecasting or the perspective I take on it is uh, how we can improve high frequency measurement of inflation, which is a topic, as, as was mentioned, is worrying uh, a lot of people these days. So let me start sharing my screen uh, first, um, and then I'll, uh, I'll walk you through first a motivation on, 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 on these alternative data sources in the fields I work in, which are macroeconomics and uh, international economics. And you probably heard, a, you know, I'm quoting here a couple of articles written by prominent economists in recent years, emphasizing some of the issues that macro data tends to have, and, um, and, and also the need for 
and improvement. And these were calls that became quite common after the global financial crisis, but it's not really an old, uh, a new story, uh, I should say. When I was a PhD student, I came across this great quote by Svigriliges, the, the, the famous econometrician who had helped statistical agencies so much in developing, for example, the methodologies for the hedonic adjustments of, of, of quality in, in the price indices. And Grilikis wrote this paper back in 1985, and he made similar remarks when he was president of the AEA. And he sort of uh, 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 argued that uh, as economists and academics in general, we had shown little interest in, in helping improve the data itself. In, he, he has this phrase, of uh, getting involved in the grubby task of designing and collecting original data sets of, of our own. And he pointed out that the, the issue is that most of the times we work with this de found data that others have collected and we sort of make them responsible for all their imperfections. So he was making a call for uh, macroeconomists and, and, and you know, other types of economists as well to go out and collect their own data. Now the problem was that traditionally back then in particular, collecting the type of data we needed for things like inflation or GDP was impossible. You needed a certain amount of resources that only governments had access to. And this is where, uh, if, fortunately, I think the, the, all this big data revolution that we have been seeing in the last decade or so uh, can help. I, in particular, emphasize always that I think, uh, you know, people tend to focus a lot on the size uh, of the data, uh, uh, but I emphasize the, the fact that uh, it has opened up the possibility of others uh, collecting data in ways we couldn't before. Um, and it doesn't have to be a government. It can be, you know, even a PhD student working with a laptop today is able to construct very interesting data sets that can be useful for, for our research, but also for policy making. So you've probably been exposed in, in previous um, events of this series to some of these data sources that I'm listing. Uh, that have become available in recent years as part of this alternative data um, world. You know, things like more administrative data that governments have, uh, scanner data that companies like Nielsen connect, collect at grocery stores. Uh, there's a ton of data on search, satellite and sensors. Now I've mostly focused uh, and worked on the last two that you see here, crowdsource data with, with mobile phones, but mostly with online data, which is the one I'm gonna describe today. And as Harrison was, was saying, I, we started this project called the Billion Prices Project about 11 years ago um, to try to see how this could be used for, for research and measurement uh, purposes. But I'll, I'll um, start uh, with the story of the origin, which is uh, quite fun actually, and, and it illustrates um, some of the potential advantages of this by making um, a connection to these five Bs of big data that you probably have heard about. Um, so I'm going to use a, some, some fancier slides that I have uh, used in another presentation. Uh, but you probably heard that big data is often described as having, you know, a lot of volume, a lot of velocity, variety. And lately people are adding the last two that you see at the end. It's helpful to understand when, whenever we have uncertainty about data to have alternative data sources. And also there's potential value that people are trying to extract for, for, for business. But I'm gonna, the origin of, of our story with the Billion Prices Project was around this idea of veracity, knowing what was really going on behind the scenes uh, in my country where I'm from, uh, Argentina. Um, so I'll tell you a story of, of how that evolved. Now, many of you may know already, Argentina has a long history of inflation and you know we, we experienced the uh, hyperinflation in, in the late 80s. Then we had a relatively stable period in the 90s, but uh, in the early 2000s, inflation started to rise again. So what I'm gonna show you here are the statistics of the annual inflation rate towards 2004, the level was relatively low, but as we approached 2006, the inflation rate start, started to rise because the government was having these a fairly expansionary monetary uh, policy. And when we went over 10%, it became part of the political discussion. It was like a psychological barrier. A lot of Argentinians started getting worried. Uh, so the government started getting concerned. And of course, they could um, uh, have uh, acted uh, you know, more responsibly, if you will, uh, try to cool down the economy, uh, but that is not good for both. So they decided to try a different strategy. They started calling the statistical agency and trying to figure out who were the retailers that were being sampled in the, in the survey. 
so that they could go and talk to them and, and somehow prevent them from raising prices, to which they statistically used to say, no, no, this is you know, something that is impossible. We have a law that says that this information is secret. So they started fighting with the statisticians. The inflation rate in those months sort of stabilized around that level. And eventually it appeared the government got a bit frustrated and decided to fire everyone at the statistical agency. They intervened the, the office and uh, they replaced the, 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 the long-standing statisticians there. Argentina had a very uh, credible and, and respectable uh, statistical agency at, at the time. And then magically the inflation rate started to go down. It went below 10% and sort of stabilized. Now, if you have ever lived in a high inflation country, you probably realize that when you go to the supermarket, you sort of realize, you feel that inflation is quite high. And, and that is something that the surveys of inflation expectations were picking up. So I'm, what I'm showing you here, um, well, there we go, is the, the, the results from a survey of perceived inflation or inflation expectations that the University of Ditella was conducting. And when it turns out when you ask people how much you think inflation really is, a lot of them were coming out with numbers that were much higher now. There was no way of knowing uh, to what extent this was true uh, or uh, you know, some people may have been reading in the newspapers that uh, the, the statistical office had been intervened. So maybe they were uh, assuming uh, inflation was, was, was uh, higher. But I was a PhD student back then, and I was uh, getting involved with all the micro price data literature. You know, there was a, a literature on, on price stickiness, and we were trying to produce some stylized facts. And I, I realized that there was a way to collect data online through the websites of retailers. Now, there weren't many retailers at the time uh, showing their prices online in Argentina, but most of the most important supermarkets were. And the nice thing about this is that all the information was basically there on the website. You had all these, these details about the products, their prices, you can sample them on a high frequency basis, even daily basis potentially. Um, and I had um, you know, the, the luxury of being a, uh, a PhD student back then. So I had a ton of time to dedicate to figuring out how this could be done. Now, it turns out that every page we see has a very structured language behind it, the HTML code. And uh, you, know, if you can teach a software to identify certain pieces of this code that tell you where a product description lies or where the brand lies or where the price uh, lies on, on the page. And as long as they didn't change this look and feel, I realized I could use these techniques that were in fact, by the way, I should say developed in the computer science world uh, for monitoring prices uh, across different retailers uh, that was widely being, it was widely being used outside academia. So I realized I could use these techniques and start building my own data sets of um, uh, alternative sources uh, to try to see if I could measure inflation. And the goal was to apply exactly the same methodologies that the statistical agency was uh, applying, but with a different source of data. And I built this price index that you're looking at here for Argentina. Uh, it's normalized to 100 when I started collecting data in 2007. Um, and, and you can see in the course of basically four years, the official index had increased by about 27, 28% whereas the online index suggested that prices had uh, actually doubled during that period of time. So it became quite obvious when I looked at this picture that the online inflation was much higher, but it wasn't clear to what extent this was um, me and the, the, you know, the technology I was applying rather than uh, the, the government lying. So I went and I, uh, this is the, the, the graph from the, one of the purpose of my thesis. It was one of the most fun papers to write because I was trying to, to try to detect what is it that the Argentinian government was doing. And, and the first thing I had to do is show that it was not the online data that was wrong. So I went out and collected similar data in Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Venezuela, countries with very different inflation levels. Venezuela by that time had like a 30% inflation rate. So it was more uh, similar to Argentina. And you can see from the simple graphs, there are obviously some temporal, uh, uh, temporary differences, but the trends are actually uh, quite similar. By applying very simple techniques and no, no, no special adjustments at all, this is data that was coming straight from, from this uh, supermarket. So I, I, I was sure it wasn't the online data by itself that was going on in Argentina. In fact, this, this slide shows you what happens when you compute the annual inflation rates 
And uh, the only outlier here is Argentina. Venezuela, it's interesting. At the time, uh, Chavez uh, was not trying to hide the inflation rate. In fact, he was openly uh, showing that inflation was high and using it as an excuse to sort of go after some uh, companies and retailers that he wanted to, to expropriate. But uh, it was a very different strategy. The, the Argentinian government was doing something uh, to the statistics and I had to try to show why. So I started experimenting in different ways. Uh, I used different retailers that you see in those graphs. Now, now we're looking at the annual inflation rates that in, in my numbers were uh, between two to three times higher than the official index. Um, and you're seeing here different lines that show you what happened if you use, you know, retailers that targeted rich, retailers that targeted poor uh, people, and the results were always uh, very similar. Um, I also tried to see if they were using the data from uh, only from price controlled goods, which the government was trying to impose at the time, and, and that's the dotted line you see here. It was sort of more volatile because there were periods where inflation was lower, but then it jumped back up as soon as the controls were lifted. And I was always getting these higher numbers. Now, and then just I kept looking at this graph and realized that the two annual inflation rates co move very closely over time. No? And, and if you think about it, um, if you are going to lie about a statistic, you need to at least be dynamically consistent. So there's a period here in 2009 when Argentina was in a recession because of the whole world was experiencing a crisis. Uh, so if, if the government said before that the inflation rate was eight, they had to actually show a decline towards uh, 2009. So if there was a sort of a natural co-movement in, in these lines. And um, after trying many things, I decided to test a very simple algorithm, which is simply dividing by three. And if you do that, it turns out you get a very close approximation to what the actual inflation rate that they were showing um, uh, was. And my thinking here is that uh, if you think about it, when you're, if you're the government and you're trying to lie about these statistics, you have two ways of doing it. You can convince everyone who's doing the data collection to lie with you, which is hard to do, or you can let them do their job, they collect the data, and there's someone at the end who is actually aggregating the numbers, and that person can apply whatever, uh, you know, adjustment uh, he or she wants. Uh, they, they could probably have picked a better algorithm than dividing by three, but in any case, this was it seemed to be a close approximation to what they were actually doing. And this became sort of common knowledge. People realized this was going on. By the way, if you lie about inflation, as many of you know, that will affect many other statistics, such as the growth rate. So in the paper, I showed that using this new inflation estimate, you get much lower uh, rates of, of growth uh, for Argentina during those years. Uh, it's easy to show, in fact, if you look at other alternative metrics of inflation that, for example, the CPI and the GDP deflator were co-moving very closely in the past. Uh, when the manipulation of the index started, you start seeing that divergence uh, because the CPI was uh, being manipulated, but not so much the, the deflator for other reasons, um, you know, those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, you can use Benford's law, there are lots of, of stuff, but it became quite obvious that this was a, a disaster in terms of the information that Argentina was publishing. Now, the other thing I did is besides write the paper, is I put up this website that would show the price of all the things on a, every single day, I would calculate the, the increase in, in, in um, in, in you know, each individual good, and I would show the information there uh, in sort of real time. And I, I'm showing you this because I found when I was getting involved in this uh, world of alternative data that in collecting my own data, that it was extremely useful to try to make whatever data collection I was uh, conducting um, uh, operational in a way and make sure it was running all the time, particularly if the time series is gonna be important for you. Even if you don't make that information public, just going through this experience of trying to produce these statistics continuously allows you to understand much better which things can fail, what things are important to control for, and that sort of, of, of thing. So even if you're, if any of you decides to do this kind of work, I encourage you to try to do, um, uh, to compute this on a continuous basis as, as, as frequently as possible. Uh, here are a few slides that tell you what happened with the story of Argentina, just to end with this. And there's a quote from uh, La Nación, which is a major super, um, um, 
newspaper in Argentina uh, already reflecting in 2008 that the vast majority of Argentines knew that the statistical agency's numbers were grossly manipulated. Then in 2012, the Economist magazine decided to drop uh, Argentina's official numbers and they started using our data. And, and then finally, in 2013, the IMF issued a declaration of censure, um, which basically was uh, like um, saying uh, to Argentina that uh, they were aware and, and, and that the, the data was being manipulated and, and uh, was urging the government to uh, correct the inaccuracy. Now, one thing I found uh, uh, in, 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 in sort of surprising of all this is simply how long it took for the government to actually make something about it. Once this government starts lying, um, it's very hard for them to get out of this lie, no? until uh, the government stayed in place until 2016. And you can see there the annual inflation rate was consistently much higher than what the official numbers were suggesting. Then eventually there was a change in government and things changed. You can see after 2017, 18, the numbers start coinciding very closely, which is a way to validate the, the, the source of data even in Argentina. There's a gap here in the data that you can see. That's because when the new government went into Argentina, uh, they actually could not, in the statistical office, they could not find the hard drives where the data was supposed to have been stored. Somebody had pulled them out and, and destroyed them. So they had to re, uh, you know, uh, design everything from the data collection process. But anyway, eventually Argentina uh, told the truth. And I, sh I, I should say, I've done this in other countries I've never find evidence that this happens. In a way, I think, because we now live in a world where this type of manipulation is becoming very easy to detect. But let me move on to what happened next. We decided to start together with my, my advisors, Roberto Rigobon, this project called the Billion Prices Project, where we said we can try to collect this type of information and use this data, not only for measurement, but also for our own research. Um, and um, uh, that was created in 2008. Uh, I started uh, working with a lot of undergrads at MIT, uh, showing them how I was collecting data and, 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 and getting them to help me uh, expand this. Uh, we eventually were covering about 60 countries. And the idea was uh, to replicate uh, what I had done in Argentina. We were using the scraping technology, connecting to hundreds of retailers on a daily basis getting this individual information and then use it to build uh, some statistics. If you think of this as an alternative data source, like any data source, it has advantages and disadvantages. So this is a table from, from a paper we published in 2016 comparing to scanner data and CPI data. And on the top, you see online data has disadvantages, which are quite obvious. The cost of collecting each data point is much lower. We get them very quickly. Um, we can see all the products that the retailer sells on, on the website at one point in time. We get these uncensored price spells because, you know, if, if there's a new good that is sold today, that will get captured by this technique. Whereas the statistical agency would usually just incorporate new goods when an old good disappears. So it creates some, some trouble. For international work, it just immediately gave us data from a lot of countries that was comparable. But there are also, I should say, some disadvantages. And um, the number of product categories that we can cover with online data is relatively few, particularly services is something we cannot get good data. Historically, we cannot get good data. It's getting better because more and more services are appearing online. And I think in a few years, this won't be a, a problem. The number of retailers and companies covered, we obviously need, have to, uh, we can collect data from the ones that are there, uh, uh, usually large multi-channel retailers or online only retailers, uh, uh, but there are a lot of uh, uh, retailers that uh, were not online, particularly at the beginning. Again, this is something that is improving. The one thing uh, we also do not get, and I don't see any perspective for this improving, at least in the short run, is the fact that we see prices, but we do not see quantities. We do not see expenditure weights. So we have to get those from other uh, sources. And I mentioned this just to emphasize there are many advantages in online data, but you have to combine it with other sources, uh, which also have their, their, their own uh, specific value for, for each uh, question that you may face. Now, as I said, this became a large research project. Uh, now I've listed here all the papers I've written with this data. I would love for you to read all of them. Of course, I know that is impossible, 
but uh, um, I, I'm using this simply to show you how this data can be used for different uh, uh, topics, let's say in macro international. Obviously, I'm gonna to talk today about inflation measurement uh, and how that can be uh, done in high frequency, but you can think of uh, uh, using it to understand how online pricing works, price discrimination may work, uh, obtain stylus facts for price stickiness, uh, and, uh, and also even, you know, I've written papers on inflation expectations to see how people react to information on individual prices. And on the international economics front, if any of you are interested in uh, issues about pass-through or um, testing theories of international pricing, LOPs, purchasing power fees, all, all that information is, is things you can do with this data that we couldn't do with uh, um, uh, other uh, data sources uh, before. But let me focus on uh, inflation measurement percent and, and tell you how this evolved and how it can be used for forecasting purposes. So this is a little bit the timeline. In 2008, I started publishing this daily index for Argentina. Then a couple of years later, we started showing some statistics for the US at a time where inflation was rebounding like it's doing right now uh, on the BTB website, which got a lot of, of attention. Then eventually the project became so large that uh, we needed to find an alternative way to fund such a, a large uh, collection. And in 2011, we started producing, um, we, we created a company called Price Stats that uh, to this day collects all this micro data and has been publishing since 2011 daily inflation indices in 23, 23 countries now. Uh, and this is done in real time or almost real time. There's only a three day lag this information is produced and, and, and published. Um, and the, the company also produces some PPP statistics, which you can think of them as being very large scale Big Mac indices, where instead of just having the Big Mac, you put in you know, coffee, lots of, of other uh, goods, identical goods matched across countries, which can be useful for purposes of understanding the value of exchange rates and the dynamics for exchange rates. But, I'll focus on inflation measurement. This is the index we're mostly known for. Uh, this is essentially an online index created with the same methodology I was using in, in, in uh, my paper in Argentina, but for the US and it has been produced continuously since 2011. Uh, the, the two lines that you see there are the online index in, in red and the headline CPI, which looks like a step function because that's a, a monthly index. Um, over time. Now, the reason this has proved to be quite useful to uh, understand inflation in the US, not only that the two lines co move so closely together, but also if you look at it closely, there are many times where the online index seems to adjust sooner than the CPI. So if there's some anticipation in online prices. We made that point clear. If you zoom in specifically to the beginning of our data, uh, you can see that happening in the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, which I'm illustrating here in this uh, graph. It's just like a zoom of the previous version. Uh, and you can see there's a, there, the online index is the one that you have here in, in solid uh, black. There's a date here, uh, September 16th of 2008. That's the day Lehman Brothers uh, goes bankrupt. Immediately, we saw these large retailers starting to discount their goods. They knew a recession was coming. The crisis was getting worse. So they immediately started slashing their prices and the online index started to fall very quickly. Um, whereas the CPI took uh, over a month, you know, it takes a couple of months and then there's a publication lag to actually show this uh, decline. And, and then by the way, by, by December, the, in, the price index online has started to uh, turn uh, and we didn't see that happening in the CPI until a couple of months later with the numbers for January were finally published. So from a perspective of trying to understand what's really going on at a particular point in time, this started to prove quite, quite useful. And it's a type of uh, uh, use that we see even to this day. So uh, what I'm doing here is I'm showing you the last uh, six, um, sorry, uh, about a year of data um, of, of the same index. And again, you can see the co-movement between the CPI and the online index, but there are these turning points. For example, in uh, early March of 2020, we started seeing prices decline and the CPI reflected that with a lag. Again, 
that took a couple of months to fully reflect the, the extent of, of the decline. And then again, towards the middle of April, the, our index has started to go up again and the CPI took a while to sort of start reflecting that trend. And by the way, there's something else happening right now, which is making all this discussion about inflation very interesting. Since the, the end of November, basically after Thanksgiving, we have been detecting a much higher trend of inflation in online data than what you see in the CPI. Now, given the history of these indices, I expect the CPI to start catching up to this uh, trend. Uh, it has already started doing that, but in the next uh, few um, months, you may see those converging. I should point out, this is not the so-called so base effects that um, uh, are being discussed a lot uh, in the media. This idea that as we get back to April, the annual inflation rate will mechanically start adjusting because we won't be experiencing the big declines we saw in, in April and, and in May. This is a price index, so those are not affecting this. This is actually showing that the uh, level of inflation we've been detecting in the last three months online is actually above what is normal for these months. Uh, so it would be in addition to those, those base effects uh, that inflation will, will start rising. Now, can this be used for forecasting? Well, this um, the ability to detect turning points is clearly useful for, for that. Um, so I have a, a, a couple of my students, Manuel Bertolotto and Diego Aparicio have uh, done work on this. And they basically shown that if you take this high frequency in this index and you plug it into a forecasting model, uh, a pretty standard model, uh, you know, that uses lagged CPI and, and gas prices and other sort of real time sources, which is the type of models that a lot of forecasters use, you can actually uh, improve a lot the predictive power, particularly within one or two months. And the reason for that is pretty intuitive. One is that you have this high frequency of data. You can observe prices in, 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 on a daily basis. So you know what's going on even before the month ends. And the other one is just the ability to publish and obtain that data quite quickly. So what I call here the speed of publication. But more, intu more importantly, from an intuitive perspective, what I think this is particularly useful for, if you can measure things in real time, you can provide information during these times of crisis, or I call them turning points, when a traditional forecasting model that is simply using lag CPI or low frequency data would not work. So in other words, in a typical month, um, forecasts that use, you know, take advantage of the persistence of inflation in the CPI will actually do a good job of predicting what the number will be. But when you get hit by a crisis that uh, uh, changes things, uh, you need some sort of live information on what is going on. And this type of, of indices, what they do is they tell you what these large companies are doing with their prices. And it's a type of information you cannot get from, from other sources. So that in those turning points, those shocks or crises, if you will, is specifically when the, having these alternative sources is, is important. So as I sort of summarize here, this measurement of in real time certainly helps now cast the present, but I emphasize it's only one or two months ahead. So if we start thinking further down the line um, in time, uh, then we need something else. And that's where I focus my, my research on. I think to be able to understand what will happen with inflation more long-term, we really need to understand uh, the type of shocks we're facing, in what is driving inflation dynamics. Um, so I'll, I'll spend a, a, some minutes telling you and in, in, in using the sort of my research in this area to illustrate how we can understand some of the things that are happening right now with, with COVID. Um, and in particular, these two events. One is why did we experience a decline that by, by the standards, you know, historically, uh, this was a really mild uh, decline or mild disinflation, particularly given the collapse we saw in the first quarter, the second quarter of the year in, uh, in demand uh, and output. Um, so, uh, and then what lessons can we learn about what's going on right here around this time and what may be driving that? So I'll make a, a series of points. First, when you look back at what happened here, one of the things I realized quite quickly is that the, the CPI itself uh, could it be having a measurement bias. So uh, the COVID shock was unique in a sense because what it did is it dramatically altered our consumption basket, all of us. We were stuck at home and we were suddenly 
consume a lot less uh, of transportation, fuel, uh, and a lot more in, in terms of food. And you, you, we have the advantage here, I'm, I'm not using online prices, but I have the advantage of uh, getting alternative data from another project called Opportunity Insights that many of you I'm sure have heard about uh, down here at Harvard and Brown University. And what they did is they uh, managed to get data from credit and debit card transactions and uh, produce indices that tell you how much people are spending in each one of these categories that you see listed here over time relative to pre-pandemic levels. And what these numbers are showing is that there was this huge collapse in spending at the beginning of the pandemic and then a gradual recovery, mostly in categories like healthcare and apparel and transportation, but categories that have to do with travel, for example, remained uh, very low. Uh, and this is very important for the purposes of measuring inflation during the crisis, because the CPI is constructed, as many of you know, with a fixed basket of weights for these different categories that gets updated in the best of cases once a year. The US is one of the countries that does this more often. But the last time they were updated was in December of 2019. So during this time, the CPI was using a basket that was not really representative of what people were actually experiencing. So uh, if you take these changes in spending patterns and you adapt the CPI basket, you actually get a COVID CPI um, inflation index that shows the inflation, it was actually much, much higher. Well, for the standards of the US, uh, about uh, uh, 50 basis points uh, towards the end of the year, uh, much closer to 2% traditional target uh, that, the, that the Fed uh, has. No? And obviously this is a temporary bias, but I bring it up because if you're interested in forecasting inflation, there's a lot of a discussion uh, and Harrison mentioned this, a lot of Americans who feel inflation has been higher or are worried about inflation. Um, uh, they have certainly experienced more inflation, all of us have, than what the official statistics have done. So even if it's a temporary bias uh, for uh, topics that have to do with uh, inflation expectations and how anchored they are, I think it's important for us to recognize there has been uh, more inflation that, than, than um, uh, what the official statistics uh, perceive. But um, there are uh, other reasons that COVID uh, matters in uh, looking forward. One is that it has shifted a lot of our uh, uh, purchases online. And a couple of years ago, I wrote a paper that tried to show why is it that online prices tend to anticipate what we see later in the CPI. And, and what I found in that work was that um, uh, online prices tend to react faster to, to some aggregate shocks to the extent then that um, um, COVID is moving us online, it's a bit worrisome because whatever shocks these retailers are going to experience moving on, imagine their costs continue to go up, then we're likely to see that passed on quite quickly into retail prices. The logic for this, let me uh, spend a few seconds on that, um, is, is actually quite straightforward. When you go to the online world, there's a lot more frequent price changes. In part, this could be driven by the fact that many online retailers use um, uh, pricing algorithms that automatically adjust to the data that they are collecting. And so even those that do not do that, they're monitoring the competitors very closely. So you see the frequency of price changes increasing dramatically. And in the paper, I actually show that historically, since we started collecting data for these large multi-channel retailers, over time, the, 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 the frequency of price changes had increased dramatically. You know? To give you a sense of these numbers, um, uh, at the beginning of, of our data collection, the implied duration for a, a given price was about uh, nine or 10 months. Uh, by the end of this sample in 2018, we were talking about three to four months. So it had dramatically altered the frequency of adjustment within these large companies that had to suddenly compete with these online retailers. And the other thing that it, the, the online pricing has there's a lot of uniformity in pricing. So 30 years ago, uh, Walmart could have different pricing in San Francisco and in, than in Boston. Nobody could even know about this. But the online world actually introduces a lot of transparency and, 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 and people can see those changes. So, uh, and they react negatively. It's what my late colleague, uh, Julio Rotenberg uh, uh, would have called uh, a fairness concern. 
uh, you know, many of us do not feel it's fair if they charge us a different price online or offline or across different locations. So you end up with these large companies having uh, this uh, geographical uniformity in their prices, which means that they end up reacting not to local shocks, but the more aggregate type of, of events. No? So you put those two things together, you get more cost pass through, which is one of the things I showed in, the, in that paper. Uh, in particular, when you looked at gas prices and exchange rates, the level of pass through has actually um, increased over time. So this is a worrisome uh, uh, outcome for uh, the move to online purchases from the perspective of inflation dynamics. I will say the others, some reasons to be more optimistic in that uh, you know, we wrote a paper together with some uh, colleagues uh, last year on the trade war and trying to see how quick the pass through of the trade war was um, and these additional tariffs. And uh, what we found is that the, at the retail level, the pass through was actually quite slow as long as the retailers felt that the shock was going to be temporary or they found other ways to adapt. So. COVID is certainly something that many, I, I believe many companies may have felt at the beginning in particular to be a temporary type of shock. So that prevented some of the initial pass-through. Um, and unfortunately, COVID is not a type of crisis that you, you can find easily other ways to adapt. So that would be uh, more problematic. But just to finish with these ideas, what I think has been key to the inflation dynamics we saw at the beginning of the crisis and what we're seeing right now it's not just what everybody talks about the demand side, but also what's happening with the supply disruption. So I'm going to show you a few slides now on uh, recent work that I'm doing to try to understand how much supply disruptions in, during COVID are affecting prices. This is joint work with Oleski Kristov at the Bank of Canada. And what uh, we are doing is, again, trying to tap into these alternative data sources in a new way. Um, so many of us know that, you know, these supply disruptions combined with the sudden surge in demand in some sectors uh, produce a lot of stockouts. You probably experienced this by going to many of the, the stores. Now, it turns out online you can see when a product is out of stock in some retailers. So we concentrated on the subset of retailers that show this information. So I'm highlighting it. For example, this product here was out of stock. I can see that information and put it into our database and then build an index of the share of items that are out of stock, which is what you see here uh, for the US. Uh, before the pandemic started, roughly between 12 and 13% of items were out of stock. And then we see this sudden surge uh, going above 20% and then a gradual decline. It took basically until the end of the year for us to see the same level of stockouts that we had seen before. Uh, there are similar patterns in other countries, obviously with some heterogeneity, in some the adjustment is quicker than in others. Now, interestingly, these stockouts were positively correlated, as we might have expected, with uh, sectoral inflation, usually with a lag. So what you're looking at here is simply a scatter plot of the inflation rate uh, on a monthly basis, but measured every single day. Uh, and then on the y-axis, you have the fraction of out of stock for the category of food and beverages in the U.S., and the different colors and numbers show you the different months of the years. So towards the end of February, we were around this level. And then we see a sudden increase in the level of, of out of stock uh, towards the end of, of, of March. That starts putting pressure on inflation and start rising. Towards the end of April, we get to the peak of monthly inflation. And then there's a gradual decline that happens until the end of, of July. So there's this co movement that it looks very sequential in a way. We have been in the paper detecting that um, this was not only increasing prices, but sectors that were experiencing a lot of stockouts uh, were sectors where the retailers reduced the frequency of price declines. And if they had to do price declines, they were doing it by smaller magnitude. So in a way, this was preventing prices from collapsing further, um, um, which I, I think is something that is uh, unappreciated when you look at those inflation series. People think that we haven't seen an increase, but we haven't seen the decline that we would have otherwise seen if we had not experienced this sort of supply disruption. Now, stockouts decline, and you may be thinking, well, but that means we're out of the woods here. Uh, and, 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 and here's uh, where the data can sound seem tricky. Um, it turns out that stockouts seem to have improved. Uh, when you go to these retailers, you do not find many goods as being labeled out of stocks. But what happened is that many of these companies 
the, removed completely uh, some, some varieties. And we have seen a, a decline in the total amount of goods that are actually offered for sale in these uh, retailers. And you see here an index where I've normalized the number of goods we find on the websites of these companies uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And today we're roughly about 20% below in the total product availability. So I believe this is an indication that supply disruptions are still being quite important for many of these companies. They're just having trouble bringing these goods back into the market. And this will certainly continue to put some upward pressure on, on prices for some months. Now I realize I'm out of time. I apologize if it takes longer. I'm happy to take questions afterwards, but let me just conclude with three ideas. One is, I think online data and, and, and you know, alternative data in general provide uh, a unique measurement opportunity. We can improve measurement, not only for the speed, the frequency, but also the details and the customization we can give to some of the statistics. And um, it has also opened up the possibilities for anyone to collect this, this data, um, which I would encourage many of you who are PhD students uh, to do. Uh, this is easier than, than it may sound. Um, now, if you do good measurement in real time, it's definitely going to be useful for short-term forecasts or nowcasts, if you will, particularly, as I mentioned, during times of crisis and shocks. But what I consider more important, I think, or more general, if you will, is that if we uh, make efforts to improve our microdata, uh, we can greatly improve our understanding on how shocks propagate through the economy, uh, how they're, they're passed on to prices, and that will help us understand you know, long-term dynamics of inflation much better and allow us to make more uh, sort of long-term predictions of where we are headed. So let me end up with that. Thank you very much, and I'm happy then to take questions. Alberto, thank you so much. That was, uh, that was really fantastic. Um, thanks for staying on time and also I think giving uh, a huge amount of content that, that we can now uh, use uh, to build our panel uh, discussion around. So, so let me, um, so I think that the arrangement is, uh, let me introduce the, the panelists. We'll, we'll, we'll have uh, each of the panelists make, make uh, a few comments on, on Alberto's talk and then uh, we'll gather some, some, some questions uh, also from the Q&A. So if you have some questions, uh, uh, please share them. So Alberto, I think in the Q&A, there are also already some technical questions for you. You feel free to answer those. It seems like you've succeeded in getting PhD students interested from what I gather from these, from these uh, questions. And then, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. Uh, so let me, let me uh, introduce our, our three panelists. Um, the, our first panelist, Eve uh, Lampieri is the head of uh, Alpha Predictor Research. Uh, Eve uh, works on a variety of uh, signal uh, uh, research for, for, for CFM. He holds a PhD in cosmology and a uh, physics MSc uh, from Cambridge University. Uh, he also has a master's in, uh, in mathematics from uh, the Université Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris, and also a master's in engineering uh, from the L'École Centrale in Paris. Our second panelist, uh, Jose Shankman, is the uh, Charles and Lin Zhang Professor of Economics at Columbia University. Uh, he's also the Theodore Wells 29 Professor of Economics Emeritus at, at Princeton uh, and a research associate in the ER. Jose has uh, a long list of, of, of career accomplishments, a uh, member of the National Academy of Sciences, fellow of the Amer uh, American Academy of Sciences, fellow of the American Venice Association, and uh, recently he also won the CME Group MSRI Prize in innovative quantitative applications. Uh, and our third panelist is Mike, uh, Michael Woodford, John Bates Clark, Professor of Political Economy at Columbia University. Uh, uh, Mike also has a huge list of accomplishments as well, including MacArthur Fellow, Guggenheim Fellow, Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's the 2007 recipient of the Deutsche Bank Prize in Financial Economics, 2018 recipient of the Bank de France TSE Prize in Monetary Economics. Uh, Mike has uh, written arguably the, the, the defining treatise of monetary economics, uh, interest in prices, foundations of a theory of monetary policy. That's sort of the Bible, uh, at least as far as I can tell, for, for the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, and, and also, I think kind of maybe more relevantly, uh, uh, Mike is also heading up a behavioral econ macroeconomics group at the NBR, which I think is uh, going to be very timely for touching on a number of the topics that Alberto talked about, such as you know the types of uh, inflation that households are currently experiencing. All right. So with that, let me uh, let me kind of uh, kind of go in reverse reverse order. Let me introduce. Let me kind of ask uh, Mike Whitford uh, to make his comments. Mike, the floor is yours. 
Okay, thanks. Um, so I, I think Alberto, uh, you know, gave a very stimulating talk, and I, I think he's very much to be praised for his work launching uh, the Billion Prices Project. This has been uh, um, very valuable for creating a new source of information that's that's useful for a lot of kinds of studies. Um, in my view, the particularly exciting aspect of it is the contribution that it can make to better understanding price setting by firms. This is a, a very central issue in macroeconomic modeling to understand um, price setting by individual price setters in order to understand the process by which prices in general adjust. And for testing specific models of this, having very disaggregated data on individual prices and having higher frequency data are both extremely valuable things. And, and so this new methodology, I think, is going to prove uh, very important for that. The main theme of this session is something different, which is measurement of overall inflation and, and forecasting of overall inflation. And so I want to focus mostly on that. I think it's clear that the, uh, the Billion Prices Project can um, help us uh, to some extent with that, it clearly allows faster information about what's going on with prices. Uh, that can clearly matter, particularly at what Alberto was calling turning points. I think he demonstrated that very clearly. Uh, if you think back to the onset of the COVID crisis, uh, all through April, if you only had the CPI data to look at, your most recent number would be the March CPI number. And that was still saying prices were higher in March than they had been in February. Uh, you would not realize from that that prices were uh, falling, uh, many prices falling relatively dramatically as he showed his time series would have shown you that from uh, already early in March, all you know, through the later part of March and certainly uh, on through April, you would have realized that for many weeks, uh, prices had definitely been falling. And so you know, this is a clear example of how if you want to know uh, what's happening to inflation at a pretty high frequency, it can be very valuable to have um, this additional source of information. I think though it's important to point out that the thing that people most care about in tracking inflation, I think both what policymakers both most need to know about, but also investors, what investors are really concerned about isn't so much where are prices this week, but asking what the outlook for inflation is over the next few years. And so not even the outlook over the next month or two, but the outlook over the next few years, which is what matters for asking if financial assets might be you know, very much mispriced and what also matters for deciding whether policy, maybe is the stance of policy in fact uh, behind the curve as, as, as people often say. And, uh, so the question is, you know, how can one learn about underlying trends in inflation that you expect to, uh, to persist for a few years? It's clear that one would like to know about changes in those trends as early as possible. I mean, that's, that's obviously the case. But it's not as clear that more up-to-the-minute information on prices that are already being set can really do a lot to solve that problem. Um, you know, when you ask what are people trying to figure out right now, and it's clear, as Harrison said in his introduction, there's a lot of concern right now about what's happening with inflation. I think a lot of people are asking, could it be possible that despite the fact that we've had consistently low inflation for the past decade and more, you know, might we be on the brink of a period where inflation is going to be higher, meaning going to be higher maybe for the next few years? That's a very important question, but it's mostly a question about things that haven't happened yet. Right? You need to start making guesses about how are people going to spend the stimulus checks that they haven't, most of them haven't gotten them yet, but, but you know, we know are coming, uh, additional unemployment benefits, how will they spend that money when they get it, when some firms find increased demand for their products, what are they going to do then, how are they going to be setting prices, what's going to happen um, as more people are uh, being employed as the economy expands further, what's going to happen to wage bargaining, you know, over the coming year and the year after that. Similarly, questions like um, policy questions, you know, will the Biden administration, in fact, uh, succeed in getting the kind of ambitious spending plans that people are talking about, but a lot of them haven't been enacted yet. 
what's the Fed going to do if in fact aggregate demand does surge and many people are facing capacity constraints and prices do start going up, it'll be crucial to ask, well, what do you think the Fed is gonna do? And, you know, these are important questions, but we can't answer them by looking at what's happened to prices that are already being set. Now, these are, these are questions about trying to make educated guesses about things that may be happening soon for reasons we know something about, but that, that haven't already happened. In the case of what you can learn about inflation trends from the data you already have, and it's certainly important to try to track inflation trends using what data you have, I think it's important to say, well, dis more disaggregated prices can definitely help. Just looking at aggregate measures like the last few months CPI releases is clearly uh, not the best job that you can do. Uh, people like the, the New York Fed publish on their website an underlying inflation gauge, which is an attempt to try to track underlying trends in inflation. If you ask how do they do that, well, they look at very disaggregated prices. They don't just look at the past, uh, the past few months of the CPI. They look at very disaggregated prices because they want to look at which prices are going up more than others to try to infer from historical correlations to what extent price changes are likely to be transitory components or, or represent, um, represent trends in those prices, but they don't just look at disaggregated prices. They, uh, to do that, they found they can do a better job of separating transitory price movements from trend movements by also looking at a lot of financial series, by also looking at a lot of real variables that help them um, in, this, um, in this forecasting question. Furthermore, when you ask, well, you know, is better data on disaggregated prices an important input? The answer is yes. But in the case of you ask which price information you want, it's not obvious that the most frequently updated prices are the ones that are most important for that kind of calculation. There are a lot of prices that move at high frequency, the price of crude oil and things of this kind. Usually the prices that move at particularly high frequency are the ones that are also most influences by special factors that relate to the market for that particular commodity, move a lot for reasons that don't have to do with um, the forces that are moving prices in general, and often are moved by special factors that have relatively transitory effects, and, and you might not want, you might not think are going to, uh, uh, are, are not going to persist. So it's, it's not so obvious to me that, uh, that really up to the minute information on the prices that are already being set and particularly looking at a set of prices that adjust more frequently is itself going to do too much uh, to solve the real underlying problem. Now Alberto showed us some interesting evidence on what his index shows right now and it shows uh, uh, the prices that he's looking at uh, have been rising faster than the CPI since December, or maybe since Thanksgiving. Um, and that's certainly an interesting question, what's going on there. I don't think that it looks like what's going on is just more timely reporting. It's delays in the measurement of the CPI that are responsible to, for the difference. I think there's reason to think that at least an important part of this is differences in the behavior of the particular prices that are in his sample. And, and one thing that Alberto mentioned is that uh, they sample many more goods prices than service prices because of what's available online. What we know from the official statistics is that goods prices have been going up more, much more than service prices recently. And so that may be uh, what the difference is here. If that's what it is, should we think that goods price inflation reflects what the real inflation trend is and that the lower rate of growth of service prices is not? I think that's not obvious. I think that, that some of the difference in goods price inflation and service price inflation relates to factors that are probably temporary. Um, they relate, you know, they relate to things that Alberto was talking about, that we know that in the recent period, the pandemic itself restricted a lot of spending on types of services and, and shifted people's consumption baskets. Uh, yes, that's occurred. That's probably not a permanent change, though, in spending patterns. It's probably something that will change a lot, even in coming months, as the uh, as the pandemic um, abates. Uh, similarly, these uh, these temporary stockouts that he was referring to, I think, probably have affected uh, price setting and, and will matter for price setting over the next few months. 
But again, I suspect that a lot of that relates to relatively uh, uh, temporary circumstances. And so it's not as obvious how much you should upgrade your estimates of the inflation trend simply from those data. Great, thank you. Thanks, Mike, uh, for those comments. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me invite Jose. Uh, please share, uh, if you can share your comments. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Harrison. Um, I'm going to um, share my screen just because I want to show some graphs. Uh, let me first thank Alberta for a great lecture and I also congratulate him on this research project, which is really fascinating and generating a lot of good, good stuff. Now, it's interesting that this project had a policy, maybe political in good sense motivation, but the result is it created an important tool for measurement and research. And I think that's a good lesson to our graduate students, to all the graduate students that are listening. You know, starting with a very concrete and practical question uh, often generates some of the best work instead of trying to make something else more, you know, do something better than already has been done. Um, now, the, two, the current discussion on possibility of future inflation and the effect on nominal interest rates you know, it's at the center a lot of uh, preoccupation of people. Uh, can, we can split in two parts. First is how noisy are high frequency measurements of price changes. And the second is how monetary authorities will react to forecasts of inflation. Now, I didn't know the order we we're gonna speak. So I said, number two, I'm gonna leave to Mark Woodford who probably knows the monetary authorities, both personally has been discussing with them what they wanna do, what they're gonna do. So, uh, he didn't say so much about that, or he didn't mention some, but he spoke quite a bit about how noisy if high frequency measurements of price changes. So I don't have much to add to what Mike said, except that um, I think there's now a very interesting literature that combines a more formal way, um, analyst forecast, other forms of, of forecasting that's coming from statistics, combines that with asset prices. And uh, I think that that's part of what you can, I think informally what Mike said that the central banks do, but you can do that. There's a lot of interesting literature on that and that may be an avenue combining the PPP information with asset prices uh, to see how well, how well uh, can you do. Now to finish, I'm gonna talk something, I'm gonna remind Cavallo his early interest on price stickiness and also talk a little bit that would also be saying something in the direction or what Mike, um, what Mike mentioned, you know, how to use the highest frequency data to test theories. So uh, you know, economists, as as many of you know, economists have used models of cost of repricing to, ex to explain the lack of smooth changes of prices. Now, with my colleague, Makoto Nire from the University of Tokyo, I've been looking at models which have a finite number of goods. The traditional model considers the number of goods to be a continuum, and some of these effects don't come up that we discuss here. In a model with a finite number of goods, when a shock lowers the cost of price adjustment of a good, that good may have its price, in, in price increase. That increases the price level because there's only a finite number of goods that has an effect on the price level. Goods which are close to repricing may decide to be, may decide, may be repriced, which in turn causes other goods to be repriced, you get a form of an avalanche, okay? Now, here's what you can prove, you know, mathematically, is that with a large but finite number of goods, the distribution of the size of this avalanche approaches what statisticians call a generalized Poisson distribution. This is a two-parameter distribution. I wrote the equation on, on board, you can look at it. It collapses to the Poisson when the parameter t is equal to zero, okay? And the reason the statistician like that is that you can have the, according to the t that you choose, you can have the, the distribution to be either under or over dispersed with respect to the Poisson, okay? And the coefficient of dispersion that, that's used in this literature, which is the variance divided by the mean, can be, can be shown to be one over one minus theta squared. Now this over dispersion with a finite number of goods kind of slows down the convergence, uh, the smoothness of the, of the averages, and so causes fluctuations in aggregate price change. Now, I give you this talk, 
theoretical talk on this at uh, the Econophysics Seminar at Ecole Polytechnique about a, a year and a half ago, before COVID, of course. And Jean-Philippe Bouchot, I don't know if he's listening, but he, of course, is the CEO of, of, of CFM, asked me, have you looked at the billion price project? So when I came back, I talked to two students, Laura Leal is at Princeton, and Harris Mateen is a, is a student at Columbia, um, about this project, and we're preparing a manuscript, but look at the billion price project, what it says about this avalanche, okay? So I'm gonna show you just one picture, uh, the daily data price changes for Colombian supermarket data. And I've used the v -shape, we've used the V-shaped sale algorithm of Cavallo to just concentrate on price increase. So I wanna say, how big are those avalanches of price increase? How do they look? And here's a fit, okay? In red, you have the data. So the data is the number of price changes in a day minus one, because presumably in this literature, one shock may be coming from this lowering, but what people usually call the cargo shock, okay? That, the blue line is best fit among the family of uh, generalized Poisson distribution that I gave you there. You know, just to the eye, that's a pretty good fit. And in fact, the theory explained why the fit is not so good um, below the median, which is in this, in this example, in log, you know, the, the log of the median would be about 3.5 to four. Now, the data that we obtain from this fitted, uh, fitted distribution is 0.87. And that gives us just hours of equivalence of dispersion around 60. So this teaches you two things. First of all, the theory comes out pretty well in this, in, with this data and, and does with several other, other of these data and also some simulations. Uh, but on the other hand, it predicts a very large coefficient of dispersion, which tells you that looking at high frequency data, you know, you're gonna see a lot of variation because in this theory, the level of the, the dispersion, the adjustment that each firm makes, at least according to the theory, is in percentage terms, more or less constant. So if it's a constant rate of, of adjustment, and but you're having this large dispersion, you're gonna have a lot of variation in high frequency um, inflation. So that's it. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for your insights. Uh, so now let me invite uh, E uh, for you to make a, a few comments. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so first, uh, thank you for uh, Professor Cavallo for this uh, very, uh, very interesting talk and uh, very uh, illuminating and uh, yeah, I really think, uh, I mean, we have been very interested in the billion price project, so I can uh, answer uh, Professor Scheidman uh, questions. Uh, yes, Jean-Philippe Bouchot has looked at the billion price project. We have looked at that at uh, CFM. Uh, actually, I, I mean, just a few comments. Uh, so yeah, I definitely agree with the premise of the talk uh, that we've just seen, which is that um, governments uh, lie sometimes. I mean, so it is very important, I think, that we have metrics, uh, especially for us in the investment world, that allow us to uh, have other measures. Uh, I mean, obviously, the example of the Argentina was, was uh, very, uh, well, was a very good uh, case at hand, but we've seen other, uh, other cases where there were question marks, uh, you know, you, you, you read about uh, China uh, growth or inflation measurements here and there, uh, here in Europe, because we are, I mean, I'm, I'm based in, in, in France, actually, uh, we've had some, some issues with uh, macro data for, from some countries like, like Greece. So it's definitely important, I think, and it's a very good endeavor that, uh, that uh, other metrics are, uh, are available. And it's true in this, in this area of big data, it is actually, uh, it is actually very good. Uh, I would like to, uh, to outline one really, I mean, two big merits of the billion price project, I think, from, from my um, investment perspective. Uh, one of them is the fact that, yeah, it started in 2010, I believe in the US, 2008 for uh, Argentina, maybe. So that is, I mean, that gives us a decade of data, which is actually quite uh, quite solid. Uh, okay, a lot of a lot of. I mean, you, you you can have a lot of other alternative data providers, but usually 
uh, you get data that starts in 2014 or 15. So this, this is really good. And I definitely agree with Professor Woodford. I think one of the great interests of this data is the granularity. The fact that you can really go down a lot, uh, a lot deeper, uh, potentially at the company level. I don't know how easy it is for you to really link a product to a company, like you've shown a, a can of milk and you, you were able to link that to Nestle. Uh, I don't know how easy it is to do that on a systematic basis, but if that is the case, I really think, yeah, it, 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 is, it is very interesting because you have the, 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 the price uh, formation at work here and you can link that with uh, other data sets like, like credit card data to really have an idea of the, of the, of the buying pressure. You can, you can propagate that along the supply chain and, and look at fundamentals of the suppliers to have an idea of the supply and demand equilibrium. So I, I, I really think it gives you a very detailed picture of the supply demand formation, uh, price formation mechanism. Uh, and I, I mean, from my perspective, I think this is indeed the, maybe the most, uh, I mean, that's one of the most interesting aspects of the, of the, of the project, this, this really fine granularity, because that is, uh, that is something that we, uh, that we very seldom, uh, that we very seldom see, actually. So um, I, I, I agree with the comment that, that was also made that uh, it's true in terms of forecasting, what really matters is it's not really trailing inflation, it's often forward-looking inflation. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we have seen uh, some interest, uh, some forecasting interest in the, in the billion price project. But for example, if you, if you try to see if, uh, if a fixed income security is accurately priced or something like that, usually forward-looking metrics are uh, a bit more useful than, than, than trailing metrics. And that's what the billion price project is. On the other hand, I do think that for a lot of um, a lot of uh, 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 more uh, government-related issues, this is definitely something very uh, interesting and very important. Like what I mean, what uh, Professor Cavallo has seen in this in this gap in the CPI measured using a, a COVID-related basket or the the, the fixed basket uh, at the end of 2019. That is definitely something that is very relevant for uh, policies, for uh, uh, legislation and, and government related uh, issues. Uh, when it comes really for, uh, to, uh, to, to pricing uh, at the, like, I mean, in the really fixed income world, uh, I'm not sure that is, that is really what, what we are uh, looking for. But I really, I really do think that at the granular level, there is, there, there is a lot of information that can be extracted. And I do think this is, this is really a, a, a massive endeavor. Actually, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of a big enthusiastic of, uh, I mean, macro, macro economic models. Uh, it's been very difficult for us in the, in the quantitative investment world to really uh, build predictors out of them because uh, data that is updated on a monthly basis, or I mean, monthly is for US CPI, other CPIs are updated on a quarterly basis, that is actually very slow. And obviously, especially as we've seen in, in, uh, in the COVID world, uh, that is definitely, uh, I mean, uh, an economy can be shut down in a matter of weeks. Uh, so you need something which is a lot more timely, which is a lot more up to date, and definitely any. Uh, endeavor to now cast uh, macroeconomic indicators and the billion price project is one of the best uh, uh, candidates for that. I think that that's of paramount interest for us uh, overall. So we are, we are following that very, very carefully. Great, thanks. Thank, 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 thank you. Thanks for your comments. So um, I'm gonna, um, before I aggregate, there's a bunch of questions which I've aggregated from the chat, uh, which I'll, I'll feed the panelists. But before I do that, Alberto, do you wanna, uh, I'll say a few words. Uh, I'll give you kind of the, the floor in case some, some, you know, something comes to mind as far as uh, the, the panelists comments. Yes, no, so those are all great comments. Thank you very much for pointing these things out. And I completely agree with, with everything you've said. Uh, you know, Mike Woodford made the point that uh, this is a potentially useful data, not just because of the high frequency itself, and, uh, but, but because of the disaggregated nature and that's how I, I started actually in my, my academic career. I, I wanted to test these theories we have about price setting and, and then sort of bring some stylized facts that we can use to, 
to shed some light in, into those patterns. And, um, and, 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 and I want to emphasize that. I, I personally think that the greatest value of all this data revolution, if you will, is not just that we can see things faster, but that we can build indicators that, um, and disaggregate the data. And, and you know, if even for our academic uh, questions, we can create the statistics that would best fit that, uh, that question and allow us to answer it. You know? So for example, on, on Mike's point about the uh, more frequent goods, uh, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Ideally, you know, if you're a policymaker, you want to focus on the sticky goods that are likely going to be the ones uh, showing the, the best trends. Now, the way we can do that now with official statistics is by focusing on the core index and removing completely categories where prices are just a lot, like food and, and fuel. Um, but um, what we're working on doing now, for example, and one of the things we can do with this data is not uh, remove completely some categories, but within each category, you, when, when you see each individual good, you can detect which are the goods within that category that are actually you know, high price changers and the ones that change more slowly. And so potentially you can build the same type of uh, basket in terms of categories that you cover, but only with the sticky versions of the sticky varieties. And I think that sort of indicator is something we couldn't build before. It, it should help us as academics learn a lot about the nature of price stickiness, but it could potentially also be very useful for policymakers that want to uh, uh, build this sort of more stickier metric. So I completely agree with that point. I think uh, even for the PhD students watching, that's where the, the value uh, of this will, will lie. And like, like Jose was showing, I, I'm glad to see that this data is helping you know, test some of those theories. I hope uh, more of you will will be able to access that. I've answered a few questions in the chat already about getting access to this, but you can get in touch with price stats for research purposes, absolutely. Uh, and I'm happy to, if you want to email me about specific questions later on, I'm happy to, to, to tell you more. Hey, thank you, Alberto. So we have about 10 minutes left in our, uh, in our program. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to aggregate uh, a bunch of the questions. And as far as I can tell, I think most of the questions, of course, uh, pertain to are we, you know, are all these discussions about worries about this sort of uh, inflation that will be coming up, as, as, as Mike kind of talks about in the next couple of years, right, with all the stimulus and et cetera, uh, do, do we think that uh, do we have a view that uh, 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 whether this is likely or not, right? I mean, that's sort of the summary of most of the questions, you know, with uh, on 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 the chat. And and I guess I would start by by sort of the following comment, which is sort of it came kind of uh, from all the, the panelists, which is, you know, is it fair to say that Alberto's research, right, uh, kind of explains why Americans might be worried about, or in fact should be worried about inflation, just because of their experience. Right, but but it's purely transitory. So 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 that uh, all of the concerns that we're now kind of seeing spilled out into the media, or or, or even in you know treasury bonds, right? Uh, as some of these consumers or some of these investors might be selling their bonds because they're experiencing, in some sense, more inflation that's reflected in the CPI. Do I take this to then mean that we shouldn't really be worried about this, this coming inflation because you know most of the signals are kind of coming from very transitory factors? Uh, that 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 you know ultimately are going to work themselves out. Mike, you want to you want to uh, give a comment on that? Well, I mean, you know, I'm not going to claim that I have a crystal ball. I mean, in terms <laughs> of the way I would say people ought to think about it, though, I would say, you know, it's really I'm not I don't think that it's wrong to be concerned about the possibility of inflation. I think that looking at the price increases that people might already be seeing is not really giving them the answer. You know, I think the, if you ask why should anyone be concerned about inflation, why should they be asking these questions, I would say it's because of uh, changes that we might think have happened, um, say with regard to policy. You know, the Fed has um, certainly changed the way it talks about its approach to inflation targeting, and at least in terms of its communication strategy. There have been big changes in the past year. In terms of fiscal policy, we have a new administration that you know, certainly is talking about a very dramatic change in the nature of US fiscal policy. I think those are the reasons why it makes sense for people to be asking 
uh, might the outlook for inflation be different? But as I said, I don't think that saying, well, if we only had better information about the prices that have already been set in the last couple of months, that would give us the answer. I think, you know, I, I think it won't. I mean, I think that, you know, it's really looking more into what, what do you think is going to happen, for example, with fiscal policy. Also, what do you think the Fed's new approach uh, really is? Uh, how different is it going to be from past policy? How are they going to respond if maybe a new situation develops that they haven't confronted over the past decade. Um, and I think, and I think, I think the, you know, the question of which prices people are seeing right now um, is probably not answering that. Thing. Jose, any thoughts? Well, I agree with Mike. It's really, really hard to, to, to figure out. First of all, I think part of the difficulty in this is that Nobody knows how the central bank is going to react. Okay, right now the central bank seems to be saying we won't take very seriously uh, inflation signals. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. For a while, you know, we we want to see if this inflation is really permanent, is is really permanent, or just a change in the price level won't bother us. Um, now, how do you operate? How do you make this operational? I have no idea. Maybe Mike does. Eve, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm not a crystal ball gazer either, so it's difficult to 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 give you my uh, my my bet on that. What I would like to uh, outline, on the other hand, is the fact that it's not just the U.S. consumer that is worried about inflation, right? I mean, a couple of weeks ago, there was a uh, rally. I mean, the uh, I mean, uh, the the government, uh, the U.S. government yield uh, rallied, so it was really. It was really a bit of inflation fear uh, around the, the investment world. Uh, so now it has quiet and the, the bonds have gone up uh, again. But it is definitely a question that is that is not only uh, uh, worrying the US consumer, it's also something that a lot of people in the market are actually actively looking at. And you see any any small news related to that actually has impacts on the, on the yield curves and has impacts on the yield. So it is, I mean, it is it is a hot topic. If you want, I I can't tell you if it's go, I mean if it's going to happen or not. I, I, I honestly I don't know. I'm not a central banker and I, I I'm not even an economist, so I I don't really know. But what is sure is is that it is definitely something people are worried about, uh, and it's something people are reacting to. That that's definitely something on the investment world. So I but I I guess that I think the the thing that was kind of most interesting in framing I think Alberto's talk uh, uh, and then I think kind of uh, Mike's comment was. You know, it doesn't seem to me, you know, so we see data that says people are concerned, but it strikes me that it's kind of unlikely that these households are concerned about Fed policy. You know, it just seems like it's kind of far too sophisticated for them, right? That mostly all of their concerns reflect their experiences. And I thought kind of in that sense, I think the, the Alberto's findings were, were pretty interesting that, that, you know, like if you look at the Axial poll right now, uh, I think uh, the median forecast uh, the, the, of the poll I cited, uh, one year ahead inflation, according to Americans, is like 3%, uh, right? And, and, you know, it, so, so Mike, do we, do we have any sense of, of, you know, do you agree with my comments that, that you know, it seems like for the, for the Americans, the typical household's expectations of inflation seem more driven by the past, right? Particularly what they've experienced, but I completely agree, of course, we should talk about the future, uh, uh, and then does that sort of affect kind of how 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 we should think about uh, 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 you know these 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 what what kind of signals you know I mean uh, what what are we learning basically from 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 all of these various surveys and these various uh, signals that we're seeing also in the treasury yield markets as well. Well, I, I think there are probably different uh, groups of people right that we're talking about. So when you ask what are you learning from treasury yields these are more likely to be determined by the decisions of people who do in fact follow the Fed and do in fact ask what they think Fed policy is really going to be like under this new regime. When you ask about broader surveys of what households are thinking, I think it's probably right that for the most part, those expectations respond a lot to people's personal experiences. And I think you know, what studies have shown is that particular prices like 
gasoline prices seem to have a particular effect on the general public's um, understand, you know, forecast of inflation or sense of what inflation is, just because it, it's it's something very visible. It's something they may purchase frequently if they, you know, if they're a commuter driving a car, they uh, they fairly often uh, are observing what the gasoline price is and paying attention to it and. And, but this is very different, I think, from what the expectations might be that are shaping, um, uh, you know, shaping bond market prices. And if, you know, if you're asking, what do we care about? Well, we care about both um, for different reasons. You know, the, the beliefs of the general public could matter if one thinks that um, wage negotiations down the line could be affected by people's sense of you know, how, how much of a wage increase they need to demand because of their sense of what inflation is, regardless of what the experts are saying inflation is. Um, although it would be at that point that you thought it was affecting wage negotiations, that it would, um, um, that it would really matter. Jose? Well, I think I said what, uh, already what I think about this topic, that is, um, there are two parts to this, of course. There's the part of thinking what expectations are and the part of thinking what is the Fed going to do? Because, you know, the expectations are not really about so much about the Fed. They, people make expectations, as, as Mike said, based on past behavior prices for the consumers. The markets may be more trying to figure out what, what the Fed is going to do because that's part of what determines, you know, yields for treasuries and so on. Now, um, as I said, there's some literature now trying to combine those things. Most of the literature I've seen assumes they are the same players. And what Mike brought, which I think is a very important point, is that the people determining the treasury yields probably are very different than the people than the people responding to the to these surveys. So how do you put together when you have two sets of people like this? As he says, they both matter but in different ways. And I, I don't think anybody has done that. Right. All right. Um, I think that kind of clears out most of the uh, 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 Q&A questions that I sort of aggregated. Um, so unless there's any more questions, is there any more last comments, Alberto? You? No, I, I, I want to say that I agree completely. I think, uh, you know, my results showing that inflation was higher at the beginning of the pandemic can have affected some of those views that some consumers, particularly low income consumers, by the way, who spend a lot more of their, their relative total spending on food may have experienced higher inflation. And that certainly affects uh, some of those expectations. But I consider that to be a more short term type of effect. The supply disruptions that we were talking about, I showed you some results. I also consider those as higher costs that many firms are experiencing, but they should be temporary. I don't expect it to extend further than the, 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 for, for more than, than, than some months after the pandemic ends. Uh, but we should keep a close eye on that and then and, and, and add it as one of additional force that may be uh, affecting the numbers we see towards the middle of this year. And obviously how the Fed reacts and hopefully the lesser price they are, the better uh, and, and uh, how they react will be very important. Uh, Harrison, can I make one last comment about what uh, Alberto said? Sure. Uh, this question about food prices is something I follow for other reasons. Um, it is true the COVID, the pandemic has increased food prices because it made certain things much more exp much more difficult to, to produce. Migrants have a hard time getting. So there's an increase in pri food prices coming from COVID. But what's simultaneous, and this is something you've written about, but it's really big this year, is the climate, uh, the effect of climate. And so if we think that, so what we see now, what Alberto is seeing in his prices is a combination of both things. And, and as much as coming from from uh, from climate, I think the it tends to be much more permanent. Great, thank you. Thanks for Exposure that. Exposure is hard, but they certainly both there. Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jose. So, um, well, let me let me kind of thank all the uh, let me thank Alberto again uh, for for such a stimulating talk. I uh, thought it was really fantastic blending, I think, kind of both academics and also a very timely and important topic. Uh, uh, let me thank all the panelists. Uh, 
for kind of uh, so succinctly summarizing, uh, I think what, what is clearly a, a, a super important issue uh, currently, uh, and, and also kind of a, also I think a very fascinating research issue as well, uh, touching on all the things we've talked about. And, and, and let me thank Adam again and CFM for, for uh, 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 you know, working with us on, 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 on these events. So uh, until, so please, uh, please you know, stay, stay in touch. We're gonna have another event. We sort of anticipate having these events uh, uh, probably you know, two to four times a year. So, so you should look out for that as well. Um, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.